So one of my one of my um, pieces of scholarship throughout the years has been the fascination with round towers. And of course we have the round tower in, in Ross Bay. And go back to the early the, the early years of the of 2000s when I said to myself, look at I'm going to do something on, on the round tower at, at Ross Bay. And that was sort of um, if you like raced along by what was happening in Ross Bay with the Office of Public Works taking over the Castle de Amor Harvest and then taking over the the dereliction that was around the tower, as you as you see. So in 2008, in fact, I had a conference, one of the conferences at the monastery in Rossgrave. It was on round towers, with a view to bringing all the scholarship together and writing the book. Now, so many things happened in in the meantime that it sort of got put on the shelf and so on. But it was my good wife, Carmel, who in 2012-13 issued an ultimatum that you have to finish the book. You have to get down and finish the book. So in 2014, uh, the book, The Round Towers, uh, at Ross Gray and its environments was finished. And it was a misnomer because, in fact, there's much more than The Round Tower at Ross Gray and its environs because it gives you a synopsis of the Round Towers environment. So what I'm trying to do here this evening with you is to give you a, a sort of a, a look at that, to, um, you know, at, at the work, to give you some background to the to the round towers, and maybe to encourage you to look anew at the at the at, uh, round towers around uh, around uh, Ireland. And there are round towers in all of the four counties in Ireland, as you see from the map uh, there. Four counties have no round towers at all. It, for 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 a an individual piece of architecture, and incidentally. It is the only unique piece of architecture that Ireland has offered to Europe. There is one more, I talk about that during my, there's another piece as well. The round tower is unique. Now there are round towers in Europe, but they're all attached to buildings. Ours, and that is the key thing about the Irish round tower, it is a separate monument standing alone. Uh, several works uh, recently, within in modern times, you have uh, George Lennox, Barrows, that's the one that came out, it must be 30, 40 years ago now. This little one here by Hector MacDonald, who's from, he's an artist up in County Antrim. Uh, Roger Stalley's little one in the Irish Round Towers. Then Brian Lawler's one here. And then the latest one would be this one by Ty, Ty O'Keefe. And as you can see from the map uh, here, uh, there are various shapes and so on, as we've seen. So that's a statistic anyway. In all but 24, uh, in all but four counties of Ireland, you have round towers. Ardmore, of course, the one that most magnificent round tower, epitomizes the structure itself, and it brings all of the individual features uh, together uh, with it. You see there the tapering. That's the hugely important thing for the tower itself. And it's salutary to remember as well that I don't think there's no tower in Ireland has its original cap. All the caps have been have been put back on. But this one has a special place in both in my memory and what I have tried to do. Back in the late 60s, I heard about a school tour going from Rossbury to visit the Round Tower at Ardmore, passing the Round Tower in Rossbury and never seeing it. And I said, yeah, that's wrong. I mean, somebody should do something about that. You know? And somebody says to me, why don't you do something about it? And I've been trying ever since, you know, since for the last 50 years. Are, are so. But to look at the round tower there, as I said, the tapering, and the, that, that's so important, the, the, the cylinder, that it has to taper, otherwise it can fall, and its strength is, of course, it falls in on itself. That's the hugely important thing to do. Ardmore in County, County Waterford there. And of course, the round tower itself lends itself to all sorts of cartoons. Every lecturer in in architecture, archaeology in Dublin, first year students that go in, they have to recite them all of this, the all of the jokes about phallic symbols and the whole lot of things like that. The one I like the best is there, the abbot says the snooker table has to go. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's a Martin Turner cartoon or not. But the, the round tower lends itself to more jokes and more comical remarks than any other piece of architecture that you have in Ireland. So Devonish on the right, and of course, as you know, from uh, from McNoise there. The number of round towers. There is not unanimity among scholars about what you're speaking of. We're fairly certain there were 97 that we know of 
and alleged that steel key, key is Tycho Keefe, right? But we know that there are at least 65 now at sites. Some people say 66, Lawler lists 73 attached sites. The important thing about this is that the two towers, one at Clonmacnoise, Champlain, and the one at Glendalough, which attach to the church, are not regarded as genuine round towers. So if you discount those, you have you have a rook tower, of course, in front of that but the other one is not regarded as a genuine round uh, tower. There are two in Scotland, in South Scotland, and there's one in the Isle, in the Isle of Man. So if you remember that, there, 65 um, round round towers. And of course, again, of any monument that you wish to, wish to speak of, there have been more theories about them. And a lot. Built by the Danes, that was, if you're old enough, when you went to school, the simple thing was, they were built as places of refuge in time of attack by the Vikings. The monks ran up, up the ladder, pulled the ladder after them, and got into the tower. Yeah, and that's what we all grew up on. I mean, if you're a certain age, you know, the thing about that is, it's the most dangerous place to be, you know, there because it was a fire trap for, for nothing else. They could smoke you out if they couldn't do any, anything else. But this is what we had on it. Built by the Danes as watchtowers, then converted into towers by the Irish. There were Eastern, these are all theories that were written ad nauseum throughout the 19th century. Eastern pre Christian cultures in Ireland, there were fire temples, there were stations for announcing the Druidy festivals, there were sundials, astronomical observatories, penitential prisons, even, and then Buddhist or phallic temples. You take your pick, somebody else had a, had, had, had a theory about it. There was another fellow, I think he, he produced a pamphlet, and he proved that it was there by tasting it. He was going around licking around towers with his tongue. You know, I wrote a pamphlet about the, about the, the, the extraordinary. And this man, Henry O'Brien, in the 1830s, wrote a book into which he, 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 he just put every bit of his scholarship into the book. Whether it had to do with round towers or not, it didn't even matter. But he filled the book with these no nonsensical things. But nonsense and all as it is, it's still been trotted out. There it's the same book, Atlantis in Ireland, published recently, The Round Towers of Ireland, who had strange structures, so and so, so and so, so and so, and the whole lot. He was a bit peeved because the Ryan Irish Academy in, in the 1830s held a competition on the question of round towers. He didn't win it. It was Petrie, as we'd see, won it. And that was Petrie was the one who decided and you know, what the towers were. But this man's book is there, and it still goes on. This is a professor in Kansas that has written this book recently. It captures the magnetic frequencies of the sun, and that around the tower the earth is more fertile. Your cereals will grow better, etc., etc. Now, this is not the 19th century. This is now still being trotted out. Nature's silent music of, 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 of that. But here's the man who put the kibosh on all of these theories, George Petrie, uh, in published in the Transaction of the Royal Irish Academy in the 1830s, and he won the prize for it. His, he, his big one, it was he who designed the O'Connell Monument, in the, and it was never finished because it was supposed to be a big Averno Romanesque church at the, at the bottom of it. But he was the man who proved conclusively that the Round Towers were always associated with a religious settlement with an ecclesiastical, that they were part of the ecclesiastical structure. It, it wasn't a big, when you look back on them, because every time the Round Tower is mentioned in the Annals of Ireland, the word they use is Clig Hyok, Belfry, right? Bell Tower. That's, what, that's the word they choose for it. So basically, that's what they were. They're, they're, they're belfries there. So the origins, where did we get them from? Roger Staley says it remains an open question. We're not sure where they were derived. You know, there are theories, of course. Everybody has theories. The one I like the best is that they are actually based on Ravenna, a beautiful city that Carol and I have had the pleasure of visiting a couple of, uh, of times, the city of towers. And Hector MacDonald is convinced that the idea of the tower, the minaret, and on the Adriatic, as Ravenna is, and Ravenna, of course, is now inland, but at the time, well, back a thousand years, it was very much on the Adriatic. It was one of the great ports of Italy. So you have the sequence from, from Egypt or North Africa of the minaret 
of the, the bells ringing or the muzzle being Ravenna, Irishmen coming from Rome or on pilgrimage bringing back the idea from the city of towers. Other people think that they were the stair towers in Carolingian churches in southern Germany. The plan of St. Gaul has towers as well. But all of these towers are attached to churches out there. And you have the eastern minarets. And what were their Irish uh, um, prototypes? We don't know. The thing is, it would never be answered. The stone tower, as we look at it now, were there wooden towers before that? Were there there? Were there prototypes there? And then when they got to find the use of being able to use, um, go from dry stone to, to mortar and so on to be able to use that. So you can get the height in it. There are some of the towers in, in Ravenna. Uh, not the same as ours, of course, but then you wouldn't expect it because you're going from a different climate. So you don't get the top of them are, are tiled. You don't get as many windows. Why would you? Because the, the, the climate is totally, is totally different. But he, he argues, and to my mind fairly convincingly, uh, that Ravenna could have been the prototype of the, of the round tower, where the idea came from. Their purpose was multifunctional, but there is no doubt they were built for a serious religious purpose. As I said, plague, kyok, belfries, bell tower, that's primarily what they were. But they also were, like the great Gothic cathedral, they were also rising to the heavens, giving glory to God. And of course, there were prestigious uh, state symbols. There were the treasure house, maybe, of the relics. Um, not all scholars are convinced of this thing that they were to house the saints' relics and that the elevated doorway there, and many of the doorways, you know, as we see at, um, at Kildare and, and uh, Timaho, beautiful decorated doorways, you know, that they held the relics there so that in procession that they were held up for the people to venerate. Uh, there and of course the elevated doorway uh, again when years ago the reason for the elevated doorway we were taught was that you could pull the ladder up the main reason for the elevated doorway is that it doesn't weaken the base if you put the doorway at the base of the tower it weakens it right so that was one of the reasons and the other reason is that it's elevated it's up so that people can see what's happening in there uh, the scriptorium I trotted that out but all of the, if you've ever been in any of the towers, there's only two in the Republic that you can go into and definition the north. They're very dark. I would discount now the idea of the scriptorium at all. Service building, temporary refuge, yes, of course, but spiritual protection more than anything else. Were they signposts? Peter Harvison shuts out the idea that maybe they were for pilgrims. You know, it was rising 30, 35 meters high, and you could see it from a, a distance. Probably were watchtowers, you know, as well. And of course, the, the idea of the bells, the bell clock uh, there. That's Kilmacdua on the eastern barn made of limestone there. It's, only, it's one of Ireland's only leaning towers. It leans about three or four feet uh, there on it. But bells, the round towers are always in a religious setting. That's the first point for you to remember. And what was probably coming in to become of great importance was timekeeping timekeeping in the organized church, the, 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 the times of the day, the canonical hours, and so on. So you had to have a structure for that. But the big question is, is you know, what we would shot out was these were the bell windows up, up here. Now this is, uh, this is Ken McDougall with its top put back on. But you're talking about 30 to 35 uh, meters up. You can see the doorway up there. So the, the, the assumption was that a monk would actually have to go up to the top to ring the bell, the four cardinal points. Most of the towers would have four windows to the cardinal points of the compass there. But if you've ever tried to go up a round tower, I've been up to one now in Kilkenny and, and Kildare. By the time you get to the top of it, you're not fit for much. And to do that seven times a day, you know, for an elderly man, I don't think is on. But the reason that we are slow about this is because no big bells have been found. Okay. Right? There is, there is, for John McNeyes in 1552, when the English from Athlone sacked John McNeyes, they took away the bells and they melted them down for cannon or something like that. But no big bells have been found. There is a hint maybe that one portion of one has been found in, in Glendalough. So that's a difficulty. So the, the day was ordered, the discipline, the imposition of standardized timekeeping. 
This was hugely important to the, to the you know, it's the same with, with, the, with the change in the Irish church that was happening from the Celtic church into, into organization there. As I say, no one's there. It's also salutary to remember that most of the towers, most of the caps that we see on the towers now, are probably after uh, this establishment, 1869, when these monuments were taken in to control, there was an awful lot of work done on most of the monuments in Ireland. What's a big picture you're looking at there is Ledbridge's print of Glendalough. You see the tower without its cap. The one on the right, of course, is, is, um, is Clondalkin. I'm not sure, but it's totally different now than that picture. I think they, they have put a small bit of a park or a garden around it now. They have presented in a big, uh, better way, and then you have landed up over on the left. How long did it take them to build? Well, you can't decide I'm going to build a round tower, and you just start, and you keep going up and up and up and up. You have to do it in layers. You have to do it whatever it is, five or six feet, let that settle, and then go back. And of course, you have to know, you have to know what you're what you're doing. I mean, there were master builders. I always think that all you have to do is look at the, at the tower connected to the church of Bursanostri. Can you picture it? And it's wobbly. You know, <laughs> they weren't as good as, as, as what these people were. And there were masonry changes in, in many. Uh, and the other hugely, hugely uh, interesting fact is all of the towers have shallow foundations. They don't go down. They, they, there's a, there's a uh, out from it, there's, there's a, uh, offsets at the base of it, because the strength of the tower is in itself. It's falling in on itself. That's the, why the taper is so important to the cylinder. They're basically cylinders that, that go up, and they are going from uh, the diameter at the bottom, by the time you get to the top, it's at least a meter or a meter and a half uh, lower than it was at the bottom. So the strength is in the offsets, the floors, six to seven floors. Uh, most of the towers originally would have been between 30 to 35 meters. We think that Clonmacnoise originally was one of the tallest in Ireland. This is O'Rourke's tower called, at about 35 uh, meters. And of course, the strength of the batter there. And the ratio, loosely, is 100 feet high to 50 feet the base of diameter. Two to one. That's what you're talking about there. Phil MacDua is among the, the, the tallest of them as well. And the other interesting point about it is, in most of them, the doorway faces the cathedral church. It faces the porch of the west gable. So what you're getting is you're getting a type of plaza within that area there, a sort of a processional area. And if it's true that the doorway was ceremonial so that you could display the relics of the monastery, well, you can picture the scene of the, the round tower here with the doorway and then the west gable of the church here, and the congregation would be in this type of piazza or, or plaza that's, that's there. Most of the doorways are facing, are facing east, or they're west of northwest of the gable, that's the other way around there. And they're part of the ecclesiastical suite. The west gable, the high cross, and the round tower were integral in the 12th century, integral parts of that ecclesiastical uh, street. I spoke about Boris and Astri. Uh, that's Tim O'Hoa there, we'll see that again. Mostly all except Scattery are above the ground. The one in Scattery Island is on the ground level. Now, Sarah Kieran is at ground level as well, but that's a different suggestion there. The refuge of it being a fire hazard, strong basin then. The doorway wouldn't weaken the base, the display of relics, and 53 towers with surviving doorways, 48 face east, as I said there. And most of them, we have no information no written information about them at all. Clonmac Noise is the only tower that tells us that when it was finished. It was finished in 1224. And we know that Clonmac Noise, along with Ross Gray, was hit by lightning in, 30, in, in 1235. And at, at that time, it probably lost its, its top. Ross Gray did uh, too. But there are, in some of them, this Anglo-Saxon de uh, decoration of around a thousand of, uh, and they, which sort of points from other architectural features that can be dated in England to give you that date. And you have the triangular uh, headed windows which are there as well. Some of them have double doors on the Ross Gray and English culture. On the dating of it, it's extremely important. Slain, we know, was burned around 950. And that's the first recorded instance we have it. We have it, uh, and the last recorded instance of a round tower is a Danet Down 
in Galway in 1238, but it, it is now disputed whether that actually was a round tower at all, it was just a tower. Most of the ones that survive, certainly the big ones, are all 12th century, end of 11th century, all 12th century, most of them. So nothing to do with the Vikings at all, nothing at all to do with them. Cashel, Tom McNeil, Zinish, Tadger, Osprey are all early, probably 12th century. That's the sort of time you're talking about. Now, when we talk about Tom McNeil in 1224, it's most likely that there was a tower there before that one, which didn't survive of that. And the decoration tells us about it. There's little carving and a little decoration, except in the doorways. And of course, Tim O'Hoe and the carved heads and Devonish Island up in Fermanagh is there. Uh, the important aspect in looking at them is these would have cost a lot of money. You had to have a patron, you had to have wealth, uh, both to get the stone, get the masons, get the wine. I mean, they just weren't something that you threw up on, on that. And looking at them, Clonmac Noise is a prime example with its fine ashlar, these squared stones, beautifully cut, that they must have had royal patronage. And we know that O'Connor. The King of Connacht uh, of Crowhor was involved with it, and the fellow called him Waylon as well. So the royal money was there to build what we call a Rourke's Tower at Clan MacNeys. Cashel, there's no doubt, connected with Cormac. And Ross Gray, uh, the O'Carroll Ayla, the Dices of Ayla, more about that in, in Ross Gray itself. So concentrating a little bit on the towers of the Midlands, you have two that survive in, in Offaly. Yeah, Clan MacNeys here in Sarkirn then Ross Gray itself, uh, Timahoe here and Kildare and Kilkenny, uh, Farta here in, in Ossery, rather, Kilkenny Leash. And the ones that are gone there, as you see, Tungraney, Emily, Kileshen, and Tullamine. And these ones here in the south, in the middle of Kilkenny, are an awful lot of them there are connected with the whole cult of Ciris, of Kieran, of St. Kieran from, from, from Sire. Huge cult uh, in, in Ossery. To say in, to say in here. Tom McNeil is, of course, it's a magical uh, from the, the river. Uh, the, we had a, a cruise for a week or 10 days on it, and it was magical to turn the corner to see Tom McNeil is uh, there. You see what we're speaking of here, the, the ring fort, the, the ring work, the, the, the big tower, and the Chunkle Finian uh, there itself. Now, it's called a Rourke Star, but it's nothing to do with a Rourke. A Rourke was dead in 966. So whether the reference is the tower that was there beforehand, we don't know. It, 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 there's a, a poor uh, altar, two meters added to it. God, again, my, no. something happens to it. The top of it, uh, some time ago, they added on another two meters to it. But it's a superb example of the tower uh, it, itself there. The doorway, of course, up from the, uh, as you see, from the uh, uh, you know, from, from the ground. In the 1980s, the Office of Public Works actually put back the floors, and there's a roof on that, believe it or not, inside. There's a perspex roof on it there, but you'll never see it. You can't go into it. There is not one tower. I don't know what they do these things for. Is it for the Martians? Is it for somebody that's coming in 100 years or 200 years and they want it? all these lovely monuments that they're closing, 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 one by one, they're Health and safety, you can't go up there, that's too dangerous to go up there. It's solitary to remember that the 65 towers and their own national monuments, the only two that you can go into in the Republic that you can enter are Kildare and Kilkenny. Why? Because they're not owned by the state, they're owned by the church. Uh, there. And they make a lot of money by the visitors, and it's a great visitor experience to be able to go up to the top of their own tower uh, with it. But we'd spend millions. They put up in, in, in North Kerry, in a place called Rathu, uh, outside Valley Duff. Rathu, which means uh, the North Rath. That scaffolding up on the tower for about three years, right? Doing it up, and then when they finished, they closed it all up again. The, the tower at, at, at uh, Thumbnack Night, you cannot enter any round tower in the state, owned by the state, right? And I asked why, and they said it's too dangerous, right? But why are we? Why are we? You know, doing all of these, all, all of these things. I, just as that, it comes into my mind when I was doing the book on the Round Tower, uh, I decided all of my contacts uh, throughout the field of scholarship of geologists, of <coughs> historians, archaeologists. I just want to bring this magical weekend 
in Ross Graham. We all put them together and we do a symposium on the round tower. We go in and see, and they will add to my knowledge of it. So, foolishly, I asked for permission. You should never ask for permission, you should <laughs> seek forgiveness. You say, well, be, I asked for permission. So, I got back a letter from the uh, Office of Public Works, and eventually the locals said yes, middle management said yes, went up to the top, and it came back anyway. Really. You will have to provide a business plan as to how you propose to access the tower. In other words, your stairs going up, etc., etc. How are you going to access the tower? Secondly, there is a great health hazard within the tower, as there has been a build-up of bird, you know what, and so on. So you will have to equip anybody entering the tower with a biohazard uniform, totally, etc., etc. And when you've done all of this. I get back to us and then we look at your request. It, I reckon it would have cost about 10 grand to exceed to the, uh, to the you know, to those uh, as well. Stupidly, but well not stupidly, I put it in the book as a footnote, you know. They haven't spoken to me since. Anyway, that's the, the one on the left there is an interesting historical slide because it was before the visitor center was built and you see the gallery of the, of the grave staffs which have now been, been brought in. But it is a magical, I mean, Tom McNally's is a magical place. And then on the left you have Chump and Finian, which as I said, is not a, a, a recognized as a tower. Con Manning and Con, incidentally, in Tom McNally's studies too, has a very fine chapter on the ecclesiastical buildings and their own towers there. Con is convinced that some of the stone out of the main tower was used in the building of the one there at Chump and Finian. Another feature of the book is, I have a huge amount, hundreds of these antiquarian images that are mainly in the National Museum. A lot of them have never been seen. Uh, and of course, Clondack Nice has a huge, huge element. Make a wonderful book, Michael, uh, just a book of images of, of, of Clondack Nice. You know, of, of that. So, so many of them. On the left there, you have Wakeman, uh, his book, uh, 1892, with the drawings of earlier. And then, of course, the two and Wakeman uh, did the Petri drawing. You have so many of them on it. And, of course, the fo early photographs then uh, of it were probably about 1900. Come on to the second tower in, in, in Offaly, and you have Sarkirn, one of my most favorite places in, in Offaly, indeed, in the Midlands, because it has such a story to tell, a story of continuity. It doesn't have the great decoration that you have in Clonmac Noise and that, but it has a magnificent story to tell. Going back not just to early Christian times, but going back to the one on the right there, uh, Cambridge University collection. You see Cyrus here, uh, here's the, is there's the, and then look at the top of it there, and that was the triple ramparted ring floor, and that's what's left. It was bulldozed in the early, in the 1960s, by the most magnificent huge earthwork in the Midlands. That's the remnant of it. That's what was you could see years after when it was bulldozed. You can't see that now at all. That's, that's gone. The thing is that Sir Kieran and the story about Kieran going in the bell rang in his back and so on. He knew to build the monastery there. He was much more savvy than that. This was very important, rich, wealthy land. The best of land that was there. This was an important place. That's why the church was put was put uh, there. Another small aspect here I want to draw your attention to, and this is St. Kieran's Well, at least it was St. Kieran's Well, when I was in Cool Area in 1977, we used to go on tours with the kids. What has happened to it since, it has been prettified. It has been, you know, stones put around it, it's been modernized and so on. We should leave some things alone, uh, you know, with it. And the 5th of March, people uh, go and they drink the water out of it and so on. For years, the one on the left there was regarded as the tower, but this is a gun turret at our cairn inside in the graveyard. In 1920, there was a mound outside the main wall, and the farmer dug it and he discovered actually it was the remnant or the base of the tower. The doorway is in a later insertion, and it has a bullion stone on its base. It's a very early tower because Sire, as a major monastery, uh, was taken over by Ahabo in the 11th century, and then of course Ahabo went on to Kilkenny. Uh, so Sire, and then Sire became Augustinian rather than, the, rather than uh, monastic there. That the one on the left is Canon, is the illustration of the Gun Turret in Canon O'Hanlon's magnificent set of 
the dictionary of the Irish saints, but Ken Boyle himself, that's there. And of course, Maurice Sullivan, there's the tower, the round tower, as you see there, to Sar Kier. Uh, as I said, Sar went on to Abo, the cathedral city of, of Canis, then was moved on to Kilkenny. And the tower at Kilkenny pre predates, of course, predates the, 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 the church uh, there. Um, it is the most interesting tower. You can go for a couple of euro, you can go right up to the top. Again, it has a fairly modern uh, cap uh, on it there. And this is, if nothing is known about it. But you should go up to the top of it if for nothing else than to see this most incongruous sight of a friary in the middle of a brewery. Right? That's, that's uh, there. I, I, the brewery, I think, is closed uh, now. Um, but it, it really is incongruous, you know, looking down. I'm not sure whether they're restoring it, but there's something happening there. And I'm almost certain that that, that brewery is, is, is closed there. So that's Kilkenny. And then the other uh, illustrations that I use are a man called Hastings, who traveled from Dublin, luckily down our way, through Kildare, onto Ross Gray, uh, and he, his album of drawings of 1841 survived in the National Library, and that's his one of coming through Kildare. And you see the cathedral totally ruined before it was uh, eventually restored uh, there. The cap on, on Kildare, uh, was put back sometime about the early 18th century. That's later in the century there for it. And now it's the most lovely site with St. Bridget's Cross, the cathedral, and of course the tower itself, which is the second one that you can actually go up to the top uh, on, on there. It's interesting in that the base of it is granite and then it moves into limestone. And then for the decoration on the dirt, you see it there, and you see the offsets on it. And then the doorway, that's a reconstruction on the left. The, the decoration is much gone uh, now. Uh, and you see the Romanesque doorway there, telling you unequivocally that this is a 12th century day, probably around 1140, 11, 1150 there. And while there, they have this notice of uh, Round Tower, the record for going from the bottom to the top is 49.4 <laughs> seconds, right? By, by a Canadian on the 8th of the 9th, 2012, witnessed by so and so. I would say, without exaggeration, it took me at least seven minutes to get to the, get to the top. It is, it is quite a struggle, you know, to get on the, even with the wooden ladder there, to get, to stop your head hitting off the floor above you, and, and, and so on. So for the fact that uh, a monk was going to run up and down seven times a day to ring the canonical bell, to me, anyway, there. Going over to Leash, then over to this most magnificent tower, uh, again, 12th century indeed, and one would have to ask the question of, of this, what would have happened if in Ireland we didn't have the Europeanization of our architecture? In other words, if Gothic hadn't come in, what would have happened to the towers? What would have been the continued development of them, like you can see here happening at, 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 at um, Chokmul Makua uh, uh, there at the time? One of the tallest, 29 meters, the second fattest, leaning a little bit, and its whole architectural significance at the end of the building in the Round Tower. I mean, the cylinder that we're speaking of for the Round Tower had a template lasting almost 300 years. You know, it's incredible when you think of it like, like that. But the most beautiful tower, the drum, the triangular, lintel, so on, and it had a new cornice and cap added then in 1881, 1882, around that time. But the doorway is the hugely, hugely, uh, most outstanding feature of it. Uh, you can see it there on the left how high up it is, and then the doorway, uh, the inner door case to it is less, but the closest parallel is to Kileshin. Kileshin is not that far away uh, from it uh, there. But look at the decoration on the doorway that wouldn't have been seen inside except by, by very few. But it had to do something, it had to be there for something. They would not have gone to the trouble of decorating that open doorway uh, there just to do it, just to have a, you know, it had to be this as a thing, ceremonial use. And then in, in Kilkenny it's, itself here, just on the border of, of Leisha, Hafarta, which is not that well known at all, and it's just like the same as the last one, they're the oldest surviving features of the early monasteries, nothing else survived. At, at, at Chakmukua, 
uh, there. There's a later, the abbey became a fortified house or castle much later. This is a very, very fine one. You can now see it from the new MA, from the, the roadway going there. Uh, it also is the, the um, Megillah Fawdrys, uh, the church, Grange Farta or Farta, and there's a most magnificent tomb of the Megillah Fawdrys here that was carved by Rory Moore in 1541. It's dated on the, on the tomb itself. But uh, here's the other monument for which Ireland is unique, the Ball Alley. So you have your round tower, Morris Craig said, we are unique among Europeans in that our contribution to European architecture has been the round tower and the ball alley. Right? <laughs> no, 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 no. And we're letting them all fall down, you know, I mean, there are very few of them left. Once upon a time they were everywhere, weren't they? Any wall at all, you had them there. But the ball alley is still there at Grange Park, anyway there. Some of the towers that have disappeared, I showed you there on the map, condition. Connection was taken down because the farmer was afraid to fall in the cattle. So he took it down in the early 18th, early 18th century. Other ones there. And the question you have to ask yourself is why not? I mean, there are big major monasteries in Ireland, early Christian monasteries, that have no round tower. And you wonder why not? I mean, I just show you there, that's Ahabo. Ahabo, which is a, a very big, important site. And that's the Dominican Priory. But why not? There's no evidence of a round tower there at all. But there are major ecclesiastical monuments that have no round tower. Very little reference to the round towers throughout medieval literature. Uh, in in Ross uh, there is the round tower up in County Mayo, and you have a few few small illustrations. But it's as if people, should we know they're there? We don't have to write about them. We don't have to say anything. We just know they're there. They're part of everything. They're part of the simplicity of life. So you don't refer to them at, you know, at all. Of, of that. So very quickly then to end up on the diocese of, of Rossbury itself, at the Synod of Black Brazil, it lost out. It, it, uh, the lads weren't strong enough for the O'Briens of Killaloo, the Dalgash were in the ascendancy, and Rossbury. When I mean, you're talking about Rossbury now, you're talking with the southern tip of Offaly, uh, a line across from Borough to Kennedy, and come down south of Rossbury, Eli O'Carr, that area there. We say the diocese of Rossbury, it could easily be the, the diocese of Eli O'Carroll, because that's what it was. Ross Gray lost out on the diocese, and it's because of that then, in the early 12th century, you had the building of the cathedral church, the high cross and the round tower, all making a statement that Ross Gray is important. We are not going to sit down underneath this, so it's almost feverish activity uh, to, to show that they're important. So that's what they did. At the Synod of the Kells, Ross Gray was recognized as a diocese for a short time, but it wasn't strong enough and it fell in again into Killaloo, and it's in Killaloo since. Scattery was also the other one that lost out, Scattery Island in, in there. Rossbury became Augustinian, ceased to be monastic, except for one ancient outside of the town. So the Cathedral Church of St. Conan, the gable, that the spot there survives. And of course, all of our monuments in, that, in Rossbury are all of sandstone, because the stone was easy to work with, but they're all reaching stone fatigue. Look at the one there, and there's nothing much that can be done with it. You can, for the silicone, you can, because it would, it would crumble uh, uh, there. It's just sad to see it there. And this is what I'm talking about, about the plaza, the round tower to the end, and then the, the west gable of St. Coins over here. We have very little early ones. There's the church as it was. Uh, the Board of First, First Fruits in 1810, 1812, when they gave money to build a church, would not allow them to uh, restore or repair the old church of St. Cronin there on the left, they had to build a new church. So they left the gable standing because of its architectural beauty uh, there. A fellow who was a postman in Ross Gray at the time, we're lucky that he has uh, this one there showing the cathedral church of St. Cronin and the round tower with a pagoda type one. This is from Seward's. Uh, Topographia Hibernia in 1793. There's a whole lot of stories about the round tower lost its cap because they took down 20 feet because somebody shot a sentry in the castle is in the background there. That's a whole lot of baloney there. But then they got this pagoda type top on it which lasted to about 1840. And it was at least six meters higher. That's it as it stands as it stands today. It has this magnificent very, very interesting east window. You see the doorway, the east window there, and it has this pictorial representation of a sailing ship, as you can see. 
And it's really ironic that the most landlocked town in Ireland has the oldest pictorial representation of a sailing ship. That's there. The ship actually represents the church. It's, it's part of, uh, of that. 1830, as it's done, you see Demer House now in the background in the gate tower. And then this Captain Ed Jones, uh, who was stationed in the Midlands, he also has um, prints or drawings of, uh, of Tom McNoise in the Society of Antiquaries, that's him about 1830. And this is the most extraordinary one of all that we found in the magazine. In that he looks like a fellow that's exposing himself and so he's going to be out in the tower. Ross Gray, look at the Ross Gray, the Belfry in Tipperary of the thing. Uh, a friend of mine found it in a magazine, he deals in prints and he gave it to me. Then the Denier one of 1835, then you're talking about the Wakeman's, uh, all of them, which a huge array of it. There's Hastings when he came to Ross Gray in 1841. And, Many years ago, Christy Maher, a publican in Ross Gray, uh, somebody from, from Limerick came up to him years ago and said, I found this thing. He says, I give it to you because it's Ross Gray. And it's TCA 1866. There's an actual painting of the tower of Church Street in Ross Gray uh, there in 1866, and he gave it to me. Uh, then you had the mill beside it. You see the tower there, and you see the two fellows uh, cross cutting timber here, wheels, sawmills, uh, and, and, uh, and then there's an Eason print of about the 19, middle 1920s. And what's happening here is there's a little forge uh, shop here, the forge, and then in 1932 the people who owned the forge wrote to the Board of Works asking for permission to actually expand their premises up to the tower. And there's a letter on fire saying, giving them permission to do so, provided it didn't attach the wrong tower. So faithfully, they kept two inches away from, away from the wrong tower. And that was what happened there with it. It was right on the bend. Uh, it was very, very dangerous. Cars coming around their lorries and so on were being swiped out of it. And that's about the 1880s. That's the wrong tower uh, there. Uh, at the, and it was a terrible dereliction site. I said, look at here, looking down at it. I mean, we put up with that. I grew up with that all, all the time. That's photograph taken, aerial photograph. You see the tower, you see the, uh, the facade, and then the dereliction. These are the black mills up here, and the garage, and so on. And you can see, you know, what's happening, what's happening there. And that's it there, you know, again. Uh, luckily, the man who owned it, the Delonte, decided to sell. So we came all together, we got 30 pounds, 30, thousand pounds of interest-free loan. Lions Club brought some of it in the whole lot. We purchased the garage uh, and we relocated the garage elsewhere. Uh, the Office of Public Works <coughs> came in and helped and then eventually that's what happened. That's the site that you see now uh, there with it. Um, the garage is gone, uh, the shop is gone <coughs> beside it and the black mills have been, have been not restored as a mill but as an early Christian site. So, it's hugely important there for it. And we were tapping ourselves in the back and we've done it now and the local industrialist George Faisenfeld, uh, I approached him and I got a patch of land off him here so that nobody could put a park on it, all this area here. 2008, we were doing fine until the local developer decided that he wanted to build a shopping centre. And Tesco's wanted to go outside town and then you know what happens if big supermarket was outside town, they had the donuts effect and the town guys. So he bought up all the land around here and he came to us and he said, look at he said, if I don't if you don't play ball with me, Tesco's are going to go out of town. So here we're faced with the thing, is it heritage or is it to keep the town alive? And we had to go and pay with it this most magnificent site that we had. So he bought it up and Tesco's the crash happened, he was lucky not to win to Nama, he didn't have enough money to do all the beautiful things he was going to do, including a 40 foot high wall with a waterfall, hide the Tesco's and so on. Uh, this, these are on the end papers. Uh, you see the tower there, this is what he bought, all the land here, he bought the tower restaurant there. Tesco's were over here uh, 15 years ago, a huge archaeological dig there on that, which discovered it was the industrial side of the monastery at, at Ross Bray. And that's there, the tower is not being demolished, 
And so today, that's what you have uh, there. But, you know, it's, it's in the cycle of things, you know. It took a while to get used to it, right? And then you sort of, yeah, you know, and we now have the trees are planted and the trees are going to come up with it. There are certain things that shouldn't have happened. Tiberi County Council got some lecture courses a million pounds in planning fees. And they didn't, but one stipulation as regards what they should, the facing of the building should have been. You know, I mean, there was no reason that it shouldn't have been faced in proper uh, stone. But we live with it. You have to live with it. I'm always sort of comforted by a remark that uh, somebody in the 1870s writing says, you know, he says, the railways don't intrude anymore. And just picture it for a moment. Picture these big, belching, black smoke things going through a beautiful landscape in the 40s, you know. And so you get used to it, the same as we've got used to it. Windmills are the things now that we give up about, you know. But we get used to all of these things. It's in the, it's in the nature uh, of it. Uh, but the whole site there, the Round Tower, uh, hopefully uh, we put the cap on it sometime. I probably won't see the cap going back on it and flowers going up there, but it will. And if you want to know all more about the Round Tower, I have some <laughs> books there at an enormous reduced price on the thing, right? So, Ewa. <laughs>